morning I'd like to invite you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 31, where the reading will be from verse 1 through 5. I'd like to ask you to please stand for the reading of God's Word. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, your name, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net which they have sec secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. All right, now if you'll turn in your hymnals to number 78. Uh, the songs that we've picked out today are not for the faint of heart, so you'll need to really dig deep in your vocal reservoirs there. I'm sorry, this is the wrong number. It, uh, oh, 76, sorry. 76. Oh, for a thousand times. Sing unto the Lord.
traditional optional choral closing.
Lauren, could you bring the slides up? We had a couple with the Lord's Supper that I just tacked on there. Ah, there it is. Lord's Supper service. See if I could get this set up quickly. I forgot to, I was so enthralled with the music that I forgot to put this thing on. Can you guys hear me okay? I appreciate your prayers for last week. We had just really a fun time with the family, and my niece got married, and um, we got to talk just, you know, about the Lord with some things with a couple of my siblings, and I appreciated that, and it was good. Uh, could I have Kevin and Herb, would you join me up here? You see, yeah, that works. My, um, I don't know that there's a greater honor than knowing all of you folks. And uh, I know um, uh, today is, the, the pace that we keep in our lives is very hectic and I, it would be nice to say sleep all Sunday morning or whatever. And uh, I think the Lord is very pleased uh, that you have chosen to be in church, worshiping with fellow believers uh, on a day when a lot of people in the world would either be sleeping or playing or whatever. Watching football. Uh, watching football, yeah. <laughs> uh, which for in Colorado, they don't even have a team, do they? That I, they, that I remember. Uh, we did when we were at home. Uh, the Vikings were on on that Sunday afternoon. But we, we stopped watching. Sunday evening, my nephew took me out fishing. I caught some nice walleyes and a nice bass. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so that was just great. But there's no greater honor, I think, than to come together as a church family uh, and celebrate the Lord's Supper service. Uh, would you gentlemen pass the bread out, please? Uh, my text for today is Matthew chapter 20. Uh, thank you, sir. 26, verse 26. Matthew 20. Could you go to the next slide, please, Lauren? When you... Uh, Put your, I guess, no, let's just stay here. Yeah, just go ahead and stay here. I, I thought I had an introductory. But this is, the, this is the, the verse that intrigues me. Did you ever have a verse get in your mind and you think, man, I want to know more? Uh, this, is, this is one for me. He starts out in Matt 26, 26. Uh, go to slide two. Maybe I did put it. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and, and gave it uh, to them, saying, drink from it, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until, uh, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Uh, the phrase that stuck out to me in these passages was, until that day. I, I, I'm, I'm amazed by the phrase. The bread and wine, of course, represented his body. Uh, his body and his blood that was about to be shed in keeping with the remission for our sins. Uh, and that was promised in the new covenant. This is my blood in the new covenant. And we studied that new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31 recently. So the new covenant um, Jesus referred here to would replace the Mosaic covenant. And the new covenant would be established in his blood. And as we take this bread, that is what we're to remember, is that this new covenant is, is, is established in his blood. Um, before I have uh, Kevin pray uh, for uh, this part of our service, the, the thought that sticks in my mind here as we talk about his shedding of his blood, it was that sacrifice that paid the price for my redemption. 
that bought me out of sin and, uh, and gave me a future. Uh, I can hardly think about these passages without thinking about how his shed blood gives me now access into the very holiest of holies at some point in the future. And we'll see that uh, when we get into the book of Revelation. And uh, every time I think about that, uh, I think about Herb over here, uh, because he always brings up the veil was rent. Now when that signify? Open access. Open access. I like that phrase. Should probably write that down. We'll use it in our, but you got to remember it, Justin. Open access. Yes, sir. There's also a part of how it says that we are priests now. Yeah. We become priests and kings. Yeah. Awesome. You guys are writing my message for the book of Revelation. Anybody else? The veil was rent. We have access to the very holy of holies without a mediator. No mediator. We go straight to him because of his shed blood. I find that amazing because usually when somebody is redeemed, redeemed from the slave market, what do you continue to be? A slave. But he has made us free. He bought our freedom. He bought our spiritual freedom when he shed his blood. And it's amazing to me what he did. Kevin, would you bless the bread for us before we partake? Lord, thank you for what you did with us, the breaking of your body, this bread that reminds us that you made the ultimate sacrifice so we can be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. Amen. Sage Creek Church, let's partake of the bread. Would you guys pass out the juice, please? was soon to be shed here when he spoke these words uh, and they were to be shed for many uh, that's us we're the many the many are his creation for the forgiveness of sins uh, we recently studied redemption we did a Wednesday night service uh, when Jose couldn't be here and you and I are redeemed by the blood of Christ out of the slave market of sin and as, as we developed a definition for that on that Wednesday night, um, Herb added uh, the thought that uh, we will never be sold again. We are possessions of Jesus Christ and he will never part with us. So no believer in Christ will, will be left behind when he comes for us. No believer will be left behind. Uh, if, uh, if you, <laughs> you know, if you are saved, the, the, rapture will remove us all. I, I'm excited about that. The price that was paid for us honestly was too high to let us fall through the cracks. It was too high. The shed blood of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, was shed for the sake of your souls. And when he comes for us, he will go. Because as I say, the price was too high. It's like finding a jewel and that, that's more than anything you could ever imagine. If you moved from your house to another, you would take that with you because of its value. When Christ comes and takes us up, you won't be left behind. The price that was paid was too high to let any of us fall through the cracks. If you have put your faith in Christ to save your soul, you are redeemed. You are there. So, I recently, yesterday, trenched uh, about 70 feet to lay some new power line, and the trencher turned up a stone. Uh, I don't know what kind of stone it is, but it looks really pretty. So I called a buddy of mine and said, hey, does your wife still make jewelry out of this stuff? And she does. So I'm going to see if we can get a, something for Granny made from this stone <coughs> that I discovered on our property to make me a hero. And uh, that's one of those precious things that she'll never leave behind. Because it's from me, right? I have noticed that any piece of jewelry I ever buy for Granny, it usually doesn't get worn all that much, which tells me about my taste in jewelry, right? <laughs> I don't know if you guys noticed that. But you will not be left behind. 
Those of us that have put our faith in Christ, and I think this crowd has, we will not be left behind on that day. Herb, would you pray for the blessing on this part of our service? Sure. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this opportunity we have right now to remember what Jesus Christ has done, that he has shed his blood, and through that shedding, we have remission. And we want to thank you for that. And we just ask right now, Father, that you'll just cause us to remember this. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, Father. Amen. Amen. All right, Sage Creek Bible Church, let's remember the shed blood of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Herb. Appreciate it. <coughs> so Jesus told the disciples that he would not eat this meal again until that day. <coughs> And that phrase, okay, I'm not going to eat this meal again until that day, kind of stuck with me. Until what day? Until what day? Probably the time when they would be received into heaven, along with us, until that day. Today we're going to define what the Bible means when we read about the day of the Lord. I want you to understand that phrase, because as we go into the book of Revelation, it can be kind of confusing. Uh, the day of the Lord. I believe the day of the Lord, as it's spoken to in the scriptures, begins after the rapture and extends through the second coming and the millennial age, right up until the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, which occurs after the millennium. That is the day of the Lord. But I believe that day, spoken of by Jesus, is our day. That is our day, until that day when I will, how does he phrase it? When I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That day is our day. That's us. When we're together with him, when he raptures the church out, I think that is that day. And on that day, he will drink it new with you, with you in my Father's kingdom. What a time that's going to be. I'm a, I, I, I am in awe I, and looking forward to that day when we as a group go up there and we're together and that is that day. I, I look forward to that day so much. But I believe that that day is our day. Next slide please, Lauren. The phrase that day is given to us, the setting for it is given to us in Revelation chapter 4. This is that day. This describes the rapture. After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. The door of heaven has opened. If you picture that in your mind, the door has opened. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. And that is John opening up the book of Revelation after speaking of the churches and, and uh, all the rest of it with the rapture of the saints, the rapture of the church-age believers. The doors of heaven opened, and boom, we're in. It's like the veil that was rent, and we're in. Well, here we see it pictured as a door standing open in heaven. So picture that in your mind, and we're in. And in John says in verse 2, immediately I was in the Spirit. And that's a picture of what is yet to come for us when we're given a, a new sin-free body and allowed in the presence of God. The door is open. The veil is rent. And it is our day. It's our day. And behold, uh, this is what we will see. A throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. That's what we're going to see when we walk through that door. This is a description of our day. It is on that day, you and I, I think, will celebrate the shed blood of Jesus Christ with him 
in his presence on that day, on our day. I think that is what's coming. I'm excited to do it with you guys. I think it's going to be an amazing experience. Obviously, Sage Creek Bible Church will go first through the door. That's what I think. I think he thinks you are that special. That's what I think. Next slide, please, Lauren. Today we're going to look at the, the, the phraseology, the day of the Lord. So you've got that in your minds before we launch on um, the book of Revelation. Uh, Next week, I think we'll get there. Uh, we're going to look at it, uh, you know, what is the day of the Lord? What is it? The good, the bad, and the ugly. Do you think they should make a movie called that? Yeah. <laughs> make a western. I think they should make a western. Thank you, Joseph. Yes, I think it would be a good one. The, the prequel to uh, Outlaw Josie Wright. That's right, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Next slide, please, Lauren. We're going to start with the good. The good, the day of the Lord. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days, this is now, spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also he made the worlds. Last time we met, we talked about what is to come. Uh, and we looked at some definitions of phrases in the Bible that describe these last days. Uh, these last days, when the author of Hebrews wrote that, he is talking about now. This is our day. These last days are now. For the apostles, the end of the age was already a present reality. They were looking for the Lord to come then. The scriptures indicate that the first coming of Jesus Christ <coughs> inaugurated the last days. Right there. Of the church. I believe that you and I are living in what the scriptures call the latter days, the last days, the last hour, the end of all things, the last time, and the end of the age. All those phraseologies in the scriptures refer to right now. Yes, ma'am. What about the beginning of birth pains? To be, that's, that's yet to come. That's a, that's a uh, I think what that's talking about, and we'll talk about it more when we get there, is Israel turning to their Messiah. The beginning of the birth pains. So, the entire current church age is referred to as the last days. So don't be, uh, don't be fooled by that when you go to the scriptures. Um, there are many false prophets today, aren't there? There are many false prophets today. Were there a lot of false prophets back then? Oh yes. It's never been any different. Never been any different. The Thessalonians even got a letter, maybe several letters, that were purported to have been written by the Apostle Paul. And it really messed them up. There are false prophets in every age. So the last days for the church commenced with Christ's first advent. And they're going to close with the rapture. The entire current church age from Pentecost until the rapture is the last days. That's included in that. Also, when Christians talk about end times, the end times, we include the End times means the rapture, the tribulation, the second coming, the millennium, and eternity. Those are the end times. So the phraseology is important, and, uh, and, and, I, and I would ask that you hold me to this so that I don't confuse you when we get into these discussions in what is yet to come. Next slide, please, Lauren. This is the phrase we haven't gotten to yet. The day of the Lord, right? So then what is the day of the Lord, which is spoken of in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord? How, uh, a trivia question. How many times does it say the day of the Lord in the Old Testament? 19. 19. Awesome. That's great. Gigantic hint. Huh? There's a gigantic hint. Hint? Hint. Oh, I guess it is there, isn't it? Yes, 19 times in the Old Testament that phraseology is used. But there are dozens of references to the day or that day. The New Testament refers to the day of the Lord how many times? Four. Four times. And I'd just like to look at those quick uh, as we launch into this. 
Uh, Acts 2.20, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. So it kind of gives a timeline, right? 1 Thessalonians 5.1, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Why would he say that? You have no need that I should write to you. He had already taught them. He had been with them, and he told them these things. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. So it's another description of the day of the Lord. Next slide, please, Lauren. This is 2 Thessalonians 2.1. It says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, uh, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of the Lord had come. So apparently the Thessalonians had been getting bad data from bad teachers for some time. Possibly a letter that was even purported to be from the Apostle Paul that the day of the Lord had come and they were in the middle of it. It wasn't true. 2 Peter 3.10 But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now these are the four uses of the phrase the day of the Lord in the New Testament. Do they fit into our dispensation? No, they don't. We haven't seen any of this happen. None of it. So what is the day of the Lord? Next slide, please, Lauren. Let's start by defining how the Bible uses the word day. What's in a day? 24 hours, yes, and there's light and dark, right? It's used in the Bible three main ways, the word day. Genesis 1-5 says God called the light day and the darkness night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. So in Genesis 1-5, we see two of the three uses right there. First, it sometimes refers to daylight, and that's the hours between dawn and sunset, and second, it's used to refer to a 24-hour period. But third, it's used to refer to a period of time. This, uh, a couple of examples for you. Go to slide nine, please, Lauren. Example one, uh, we speak of the day when we were young. You guys ever speak of the day when we were young? Back in my day. Back in my day. Does that mean one day? No, it means a, a period of time. Uh, we mean the extended period of time when we were young. An example two of the use of the word is uh, Paul speaks of the day as an extended period of time. And that is uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.5. But concerning the times and the seasons, that is the day of the Lord. It is not just a day. It is a time and a season. That's what we mean when we say see day. Uh, it actually refers to an extended period of time. So when we talk about the day of the Lord, the symbolism here and there are other examples in the Bible. It's an extended period of time. The day of the Lord isn't a single day. Next slide, please, Lauren. <coughs> putting all the uses um, of, that, of the word day together uh, from the Bible, this is how I, I define it. The day of the Lord is any time God intervenes directly and dramatically in history, either to judge or to bless. Did you know that there have already been past days of the Lord that fit this definition. Uh, as I studied this, uh, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. Next slide, please, Lauren. For the day is near, exit Ezekiel 30, verse 3, even the day of the Lord is near, and I will be, and uh, it will be a day of clouds, the time of the Gentiles. Ezekiel 30, verse 3, uses the phrase, the day of the Lord, to speak of the historical fall of Egypt to Babylon. Next slide, please, Lauren. Uh, th this is this is amazing to me. Do you see Tyre out there? Right there. Do you know that Tyre was an island? And they thought they were impervious to the enemy. Well, Ezekiel chapter 29. World historians ought to look at this because it, 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 it happened. Nebuchadnezzar himself went after it. And what Ezekiel tells us is 
They finally took it after 13 years of battle. They got the island of Tyre thinking they would get all the treasure in the island and they'd be rich. Well, you know what they found there? Nothing. There was nothing left. So Nebuchadnezzar needed to pay his soldiers for 13 years of warfare. So what did he do? What did he do? Plan B, he went to Egypt, because there he could get money. So they diverted and went to Egypt, and that's what Ezekiel talks about, being the day of the Lord there. The day of the Lord there refers to Egypt. Now go to the next slide, please. Ezekiel 30, verse 1. Is that where we're at? Yeah. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, prophesy. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to that day, for the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds for the Gentiles. The sword shall come upon Egypt, and great anguish shall be in Ethiopia. When the slain fall in Egypt, and, they're take, and they take away her wealth, right there, and her foundations are broken down. Egypt was taken by Nebuchadnezzar so he could pay his soldiers. So the historical fall of Egypt was called the Day of the Lord. Next slide, please, Lauren. Joel used the phrase, the Day of the Lord. Alas, for the day. For the day of the Lord is at hand, and it shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Now, J. White Pentecost, I like what he says about this. The day of the Lord is that extended period of time, beginning with God's dealings with Israel after the rapture, at the beginning of the tribulation period, and extending through the second advent and the millennial age, onto the creation of the new heavens and the new earth after the millennium. Now, J. White Pentecost book, um, Things to Come, amazing book, is more of a college textbook than it is a, a, a readable book. But I like his definition, and when it comes right down to it, the day of the Lord Joel is speaking about is the extended time that starts after the rapture and goes forward. Yes, ma'am. So, a uh, question regarding that. How could it be an extended period of time with um, the asking it occurs like a thief in the night? Well, it comes as a thief in the night. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that, that, do you mean like a thief is in your house for just a few seconds? Is that what you mean? Normally, they, yeah, they won't stick around. Yeah. In this case, it will be, you know, a measured period of time. I would go with, I would measured period of time. But I want you to walk away from this study really with one thing in mind. The day of the Lord that is spoken of in the New Testament, you will not be there. Okay? That's what I want you to walk away with today. The day of the Lord. There are many Christians, me being included, when I was a new believer, thinking the day of the Lord, holy cats, I'm going to, this sounds bad, bad, bad. And it is bad, bad, bad. But I'm also here to tell you that you won't be there. The rapture will remove believers from the church age, from the world, before the day of the Lord commences. Now we're in the latter days, we're in all those other things. But the day of the Lord spoken of in the New Testament time, and here in Joel 1.15, is at hand, it shall come as destruction from the Almighty. That is true, but you won't be there. Uh, he has, uh, Joel uses the phrase, day of the Lord, it has, it has a judgment and a blessing uh, phrase to it. Uh, the future day of the Lord, referred to by Joel, is a period of time that begins with the seven-year tribulation, because Joel obviously is speaking to Israel. When that 70th week of Daniel kicks off, that's the day of the Lord there. And that will continue, the day of the Lord continues through the thousand year reign, that's the blessing phase. Next slide please, Lauren. Mark Hitchcock, how many of you have ever heard of Mark Hitchcock? I, uh, I don't, he's a, he's a Dallas theological grad, he's a pastor. Uh, he wrote, uh, he's, he's got like a bazillion books uh, out there. Uh, he wrote one called The End, and I would recommend it. Uh, on page 101, he says, much like a 24-hour day, the day of the Lord will begin with the dark night of the tribulation, okay? And this is that period of time. Continuing with the dawn bursting when Christ returns, that's the sunrise, and then the world will bask in the full sun of daylight during the kingdom of Christ. That's the verbiage. I think he did a good job 
capturing the verbiage of the day of the Lord. There is the night, there is the day. And then there is the, uh, the time when the, 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 the world will bask in the Son of Jesus Christ. So as defined and referred to in the Old Testament and the New, we are not in the day of the Lord. That is a time yet to come. Okay, so when somebody talks about the day of the Lord, our response, Roma, I love that hat. I love that hat. Did you bring us one? Huh? Where did you get it? Huh? I think it's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> you did this just to throw me off, didn't you? You did this just to pick on me. So <laughs> I knew that. Okay, next slide. What's it say? What's the hat What's it, it's, it's, uh, it's a mega hat. Yes, ma'am. Um, so what about, uh, because I've heard people bring up um, Acts chapter 2, mm -hmm. verse 16, um, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel referring to the Pentecost, saying that that was the day of the Lord. That the day of Pentecost was the day of the Lord? Yeah, because it goes into um, the Old Testament description, like it talks about the, the tongues sons and the daughters will prophesy, the right. children of blood, the sons mm -hmm. will be dark. Yeah. So How much of that? But but note that when on the day of Pentecost, none of that occurred. What did occur was the cloven tongues, yeah. you know, which was not foretold, uh, and uh, it was a whole new experience for these guys as they entered the church age. Uh, great question. Uh, and, and 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 as we go through this, uh, I'm asking you guys to keep me on point. I have defined these words so that we can make make sense of everything. Um, I, you know what I think? I'll tell you what I think. I think that when God gave us the Bible, he gave us the greatest gift that God could ever give to man. Now, when we go through and we structure how we interpret the Bible, he has given us that structure, <coughs> understanding what righteous means, righteousness, redemption, adoption, and the, the list goes on. Um, if you understand that, and build a foundation on that, God opens up his word to you like you cannot believe. It's an amazing reservoir of information that God has given us. So our, the day of grace, we are in the day of grace. Our present time is called the day of grace. So we went through the benefits package of living in this time. And I think my favorite benefit of living in the church age that other ages never had was when we got saved, we were indwelt by the Spirit. I think that's amazing. We are joint heirs with Christ. No other dispensational believer was promised that, to be a joint heir with Christ. My goodness. I don't mean that God has never displayed grace, though, in previous dispensations. Obviously, he has. Many of God's dealings with men from the garden all the way up until now have been done in grace, right? The fact that we're even here, I think, is an act of grace on God's part because by rights, man should have been punished for our sin. But through an act of grace, God allowed his only begotten son to die on the cross that I could be redeemed from my sin. So we live in this day of grace. And I, I love the phrase, uh, people have always been saved by faith. The salvation of every person, no matter when he or she lived, is a work of God's grace and faith. But God, during this present age, I think he has uniquely displayed his grace. It is unique, some of the things he has done. It's highlighted on the basis of salvation, our Christian life, or sanctification, his grace is the basis for the benefits package we, we studied for being in this dispensation. However, after this day of grace runs its course and the church has been raptured out of the world to be with Christ, that's when the day of the Lord begins. When God will rain down his judgment on humans because of their sin. It will be a time of wrath and judgment. And as I said, um, I want you to walk away, if nothing else, with one thought. Believers, Christians, church age 
saints will not be here for the day of the Lord. We will be in heaven. We won't be here. Slide 17, please, Lord. So to recap, this is my recap. The day of the Lord, a day of divine judgment upon the world, followed by a time of unparalleled blessing. And that is the millennial kingdom. In the day of the Lord, Christ will rule with a rod of iron over the entire earth. And I hearken back to our Ten Commandments discussion in Sunday school. The Ten Commandments will be enforced. As a for instance, uh, thou shalt not kill. Well, God defined that through Christ in, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. How do you define murder? What, how do you kill your brother? By hating. By hating. Right. If somebody is guilty of hating his brother, God will handle it on the spot in the millennial kingdom. None of that will be allowed to be let go. God will fix it on the spot. He'll rule with a rod of iron over the entire earth. It'll be awesome, but it will be strict. Psalms 2.9, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And John tells us this same time is yet to come, Revelation 2.27, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. There it shows up in Revelation. They shall be dashed to pieces like, a, like the potter's vessels, and I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. So the day is coming when the Lord will rule with a rod of iron over the entire earth. That's a part of the day of the Lord. You will not be there. You'll be in heaven, ruling and reigning with him. You'll be a part of uh, the process he chooses to make these things happen. Next slide, please, Lord. In, the, in, this, in the day of the Lord that's coming, Jesus is going to minister, administer absolute justice. It's like I was saying with the Ten Commandments. I think they will be the guide. Um, well, should, guide is a bad word for this because it's not a guide there. It's an expectation. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And this is the fulfillment of that covenant, the Davidic covenant that we spoke about, that descendant of David is going to rule over his kingdom forever. That is Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. We saw that happen in Matt 3.16, where the Spirit came on the Lord. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So the stem of Jesse is David. Isaiah is reinforcing the Davidic covenant here that we studied. And the fulfillment of verse 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's where God himself verified that Jesus is that descendant of David that will sit on the throne. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And also he said, hear ye him. Okay, next slide, please, Lauren. Jesus, of course, is the rod referred to. He is um, that branch that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. This is what Isaiah was speaking of. This is his name. It is the Lord, our righteousness. Uh, next slide, please, Lauren. I'm just going to go to verse 3 of Isaiah 11. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Now, do you see two words there underlined? Poor and meek. Where else do you see that phraseology used? Beatitudes. What's that? Matthew chapter 5. Bingo, the Beatitudes. Isaiah is speaking about the Beatitudes. In the day of the Lord, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are the charter for, the basis for, how things will be done. Obviously, they start with the Ten Commandments. It grows into Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which is the constitution for the millennial kingdom. And I'm not saying we as Christians in the New Testament church can't gain very much from that, because we can't. We can gain implementation of the Ten Commandments in our life right now by following that. But in the Millennial Kingdom, compliance will be strictly enforced. Strictly enforced. 
That is the day of the Lord. Uh, these terms are found in the Sermon on the Mount. And as I say, that's the, the constitution for the millennial kingdom. Next slide, please, Lauren. Uh, the day of the Lord, specifically the millennial kingdom, is what he's talking about here. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithful the belt of his waist. Now, this is the terminology uh, that a lot of us hear. When I was a new believer, I puzzled over this. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the nursing child shall play with, uh, by the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the seas cover the sea, as the waters cover the sea. This is speaking about the millennial kingdom. This is in the day of the Lord. It isn't in our day today, is it? If you stick your hand in a cobra's hole, what's likely going to happen? An ambulance call. Uh, and so see if they get there in time. No, this is all speaking of the day of the Lord that is yet to come. Now, slide 22, please, Lauren. In that day, the day of the Lord, Israel will be regathered. They will be regathered. That's what uh, the as he is calling them home into the, into the kingdom that is yet to come. During that seven-year tribulation, things will be so bad. And Matthew 24 tells them, it's a warning to the Jews. If you're not in Israel, you're going to have a real hard time getting to Israel. Yes, ma'am. Well, what about in Revelation when it um, says that people gather his elect? He gathers yeah. them. He yeah. says that he will gather his elect. Yeah, his, his chosen people. His chosen people will move back to Israel. And by the way, by the year 2030, it is estimated that more than half of all the Jews in the world will be already back in Israel. Already there. So, you think about the day of the Lord and the rapture, and is, is the world moving? Are things happening that we could see as indicators that the return of the Lord is imminent? I think yes. I think yes. Because Israel is growing, there's 5.2 million Jews in Israel right now. There are 5.4 million in other parts of the world. And as I say, the, the scales are tipping and Israel is going back uh, to their homeland already. Is that an indicator of fulfillment of biblical prophecy? I believe so. I believe it is. That they're back in their land. Uh, it doesn't help us time the rapture. Don't confuse that. Because the signs that we look for are signs that are fulfilled after the rapture. The rapture is a signless event. It will happen that fast, and it is, no, it is a signless wonder. Granny and I talked a lot about it on the trip, and, uh, uh, you know, who, what, when, where, why, families, family structures, how families would be affected, you know, that kind of stuff. It's going to be a very devastating time. The, the rapture will remove believers. And then uh, we believe the rapture will also take children that aren't of accountable age. That's my personal opinion. There are those who don't agree with me on that, and that's okay. I just think that uh, if they're not of an accountable age, the Lord isn't going to judge them for their sin. And uh, the tribulation time is judgment for sin. You will be gone. You won't be there. The day of the Lord is for judgment of sin, and God will rain that down after he removes believers in Christ. Okay? Um, now this, I love this. Uh, let's see, am I on Isaiah 11.10? Where am I at there? To recover the remnant and his people who are left from around the world, he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel, gathered together to disperse. Even if they're amongst the pygmies of Antarctica, he will get them here. Amen, Herb? <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah. <coughs> I believe the start to this final gathering began in 19... Well, actually, it began at, uh, in about 1901. A 1871 was when Israel started to really put things together. But with the turn of the century into the 1900s, it grew. 
But now in the, in the, what are we, the 21st century? It has exploded. Jews are returning to Israel by the scads. So when the day of the Lord occurs, I don't think they stand much chance if they're not in Israel. That's where Matthew 24 is a warning to them. As Jesus says, drop what you're doing and get back home because things are going to go bad during Daniel's 70th week, the day of the Lord. Next slide, please, Lauren. In that day, the day of the Lord, Israel is going to be brought into perfect peace in the millennial kingdom. And that's what Zephaniah talks about. They will finally be, in, per in that day it shall not be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, or it shall be said, do not fear. Let not your hand be weak, the Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. During that millennial kingdom, during the day of the Lord, they will be safe in their homeland. Next slide, please, Lauren. Verse 19, behold, at that time, I will deal with all who afflict you. I'm going to save the lame, gather those who were driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. God is going to make things right for Israel in the day of the Lord. I think that's one of his main objectives there. Why would he care so much about Israel? Why Israel? Who he chose. What's that? That's who he chose. That's who he chose. And he chose them to do what? Represent him. Represent him to the world, but even more so, he chose them to bring forth the Messiah, right? That's the tie. That's the tie. He chose Israel, not because they were the greatest nation, not because they were the most powerful, or honestly the most pious. They weren't. God chose Israel to bring forth the Messiah because all those other things were not true. He was going to use them. And he is going to bless and honor them for what they did for all eternity. That's his plan. So during Daniel's 70th week, that's when judgment comes down. It's really the most uh, powerful evangelistic outreach that God ever makes to his own people and to those around him. Next slide, please, Lauren. 2 Peter 3.10. The day of the Lord will end with the creation of the new heaven and new earth, okay? The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. This is in the day of the Lord. Therefore, since all these things were dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth which righteousness, in which righteousness dwells. So the day of the Lord, which is future, will come as a thief in the night, starts with the rapture, the church is removed. And during that day of the Lord, all of these bad things will happen. And because we believe they will happen, um, what manner of persons ought you to be? As we look to what is yet to come, it is not pretty. God is calling us to his side to shape it up, to serve him like we really believe this is all coming. Next slide, please, Lauren. I... Uh, well, was Paul a pre-tribber? Yes. The answer is yes. The rapture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about that. Um, next slide, please, Lauren. After writing his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians, and apparently someone claiming to have been Paul wrote a counterfeit letter to the church at Thessalonica. Messed up their whole eschatological view. What does eschato eschatology refer to? Study of the end times, eschatology. Messed them up. Bad teaching. Now, brethren, he says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus, don't be shaken. Don't let anybody steer you off course, even if you get this letter that's supposed to be from me. Because I've told you what the day of the Lord is all about. I think in the, in the forged epistle there, the author had told them in trouble that they were already living in the tribulation. 
and that Paul had described uh, all of this. And if you go back to 1 Thessalonians and put the two books together, that's where you see this. They were told they were currently living in the day of the Lord. So this false letter threw the Thessalonians into confusion. And it really messed them up, scared them like crazy. And, uh, and, and Paul says, don't, do, don't let that happen. Next slide, Lauren. Dear brothers and sisters, this is what he says in, in our current English. Let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. How we will be gathered to meet him. We're going to be taken out, is what he's telling them. We're going to be taken out. And he says, don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Because it hasn't already begun. So it's clear, Paul gives his statement here that the Thessalonians expected, as he taught them, that they would be raptured before the day of the Lord commenced. So the day of the Lord refers to the time after the rapture. You will not be in the day of the Lord. Outside of serving Jesus in whatever role he assigns us at that time. So if you, uh, if you walk away with only one thing today, as I said, um, and you know, uh, in, in books that teach pastors how to preach, they say you should have one point. One point. I don't agree with that. I think you guys are smarter than me on almost everything. And if I don't come with 15 points, you would mock me. Am I right? No? Huh? I think it would happen. I think you guys would have fun at my expense. And I never do that to you. Just the ladies. Huh? Just the ladies would have that experience. <laughs> Some of us are not as smart as you think we are. Oh, I think you are. I think you're sitting beside someone who is a real genius. Oh, I know. Uh, but I need to still give the chance. Whenever I talk oh, languages or anything, I watch Kim. Because if Kim makes a face, like, like that, I know I probably screwed up. up. Yeah, I screwed up. Yeah, I think that's what happens. So I want you to walk away with the, 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 the one point that the day of the Lord, spoken of four times in the New Testament, is not the day for you. You'll be gone. You will be gone. When the sun and the moon and all that stuff happens, you won't be here. Daniel's 70th week, you won't be here. You'll be gone. Uh, they, the Thessalonians knew that, when Paul left, but somebody wrote them bad data, next thing you know, they're sucked in. Next slide, please, Lauren. Being told they were already in the tribulation blindsided them and it shook them to their core. They faced three options. First of all, Paul's prophecy in 1 Thessalonians was a lie. Second, they had totally misinterpreted what he said. Or third, the rapture had already occurred and they had been left behind. What do you think is the truth here? None of them. Yeah, none of them. The only logical implication from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is that the Thessalonians believed that the rapture would occur before the tribulation. You have to come to that conclusion when you study 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We will be gone before the day of the Lord. We will be gone. The day of the Lord is for that time that's yet to come. Next slide, please, Lauren. This is important because for the apostles, the end of the age was already a present reality. It was already a present reality. Okay, the scriptures tell us that the first coming of Jesus brought about the last days for the church. Right from Pentecost, we were in the last days. So when you look at the scriptures and you see in the last days, people try and fit that into the end time just prior to the rapture. That's not true. That time is from the time of, I would say, Acts chapter 2 with Pentecost. Okay? I conclude that when I read the scriptures, we are now in the latter days. We're in the last days. We are in the last hour. We are in the end of all things. We are in the last time, and we are in the end of the age. All those phraseologies are used by the apostles to describe the age of the church we live in now. So the last days for the church commenced when Christ 
went to heaven and the Spirit came down. And the last days of the church will end with the rapture. Okay? Therefore, the entire current church age is the last days. But it is not the day of the Lord. That is yet to come. Also, when Christians talk about end times, you know, uh, end times, that's phraseology that to me means the rapture and beyond. That's end times. It's just a general term. The tribulation, the second coming, the millennium, eternity, all that is there. But the day of the Lord, will you be in the day of the Lord? No. no, you will not. The Bible tells us no. Are you in the end times? No. You could technically say no, because that refers to the rapture and on. How about the last days? Are you in the last days? Yes. Yes, you are in the last days. Are you in the last hour? Yes, you are in the last hour. So then I, 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 says, I ask you, uh, uh, slide 31, go to slide 31, Lord. I define the day of the Lord as that period that begins after the rapture. Okay, the church is gone, it starts then, and it extends through the second coming, the millennial age, until the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. That is the day of the Lord when he does those things. So we who live in the dispensation of the church age are not in that. Peter wraps it up. This is his conclusion, so we'll use it for ours, right? The day of the Lord is you therefore beloved, since you know this beforehand. What do you think he's talking about? What is it we know beforehand? Well, how about the rapture of the church? Do you know it's coming? Yes. We know the church, we know Christ is coming back for us. Okay, since we know that before it happens, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Be ready, be ready, be ready. Okay, since we know this beforehand, be ready. It, and we need to watch for his soon return and not be caught unawares. So next slide, please, Lauren. Here's my job as a pastor in a, in a New Testament church era. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you, as Peter says, always of these things. I think it's a pastoral responsibility to remind the church of these things. The day of the Lord is coming. The rapture of the church, the church will be removed. Be ready. At any moment he could come. Though you know and are established in the present truth. You know these things, Peter said, but you might let things slip. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. I am, as a pastor, required, I think, from the scriptures to remind you that the return of the Lord is imminent. It could happen at any time. The rapture of the church will remove us. You don't want to be caught at that time not serving him, not using the gifts that he gave you, uh, because there is a conversation he'll have with you at that time. So don't lose your focus. Stay focused on the Lord, okay? So this to me, as I say, I think it's a charter to pastors. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Always. How many times do I need to be reminded of anything before? I, I said, the, the more you hear about it, the better. So what is yet to come is so important. Uh, any questions on this? That's why this study right here, the, Peter's words. I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. Peter's call. I think it's a pastoral call. I think it's a, a, a head of household call to stir your house to understand that Christ could come back at any time. And we, this house, will be prepared. We're going to serve the Lord. That's why I said I'm so impressed to see you guys in church today. Because it's a beautiful day. You could be out doing other things. But your love for the Lord to me is inspiring. Absolutely inspiring. And, uh, and I thank you for that. 
Uh, next slide, please, Lauren. I think this is our, oh, transition. God's remedy. Of course, his grace, an act of grace on God's part that we could be saved through faith and not through my own efforts. Simply by putting my faith in Christ, he'll save my soul from what God did on the cross. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I like Romans 6, 23, the gift of God is eternal life. The message that we share with our, well, particularly our hospice patients. Um, we know they are at a stage like the thief on the cross where they can't, they're not going to get up out of that bed and go do good works to get saved. It's just not going to happen. But has God abandoned them because of that? No. Because it isn't, there is no good works required in this. It's simply seeing Jesus Christ for who he is and putting your faith in him to the saving of your soul. Seeing yourself as a sinner, needing him for what he did for you. And praise the Lord, some of them have uh, turned to the Lord. We grieve for the ones that didn't. But we rejoice for the ones who did. And we have both groups in our experience. Some who some who won't, uh, won't hear it, won't hear it. The grace of God that you can put your faith in him and save your soul. We had one that finally, he would not talk spiritual things. And uh, I finally told him, you want me to get fired from my job? I'm supposed to tell you about the Lord. You want me to get fired? So he said, no, I don't want you to get fired. Go ahead. So we would uh, talk through the gospel and as soon as I was done, I was off on another tangent. And to this day, he's the one that comes to mind for me. I don't know where his soul is in eternity. I don't know. And I grieve for that one. More than I maybe even rejoice for the ones who turn to the Lord. He's the one that always comes to mind. My failures. Not, not the successes. It's the failures that stuck with me. It's like fishing. You remember the ones that got away more than the ones you caught. It's the way it is. It's just the way it is. So I, um, I think faith in Jesus Christ. Believe in him. Put your faith in him. Anybody out in the video world that hasn't, please don't, don't delay. Because you don't know I have a promise for tomorrow. But my charter is this, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. That is my charter. That's Jose's charter. That's every pastor's charter across the world. As long as I am in this tent, what does he mean in this tent? Alive. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to stir you up to remind you of these things. Okay, so if you get this test right, we're going to close. All right? Are we in the day of the Lord today? No. no. Is that because it's already come and gone? No. no. When is it? It comes right after the rapture happens. Right after, right after the rapture happens. So it's out here. This is the church age. Do you, do you guys get my symbolic symbolism? All right. This is where we live today. It is not past, although there have been days of the Lord in the past. Remember Egypt, but it was simply referring to God's judgment being poured out on them, and he used Nebuchadnezzar to do it. We're in this time today, the church age. We are in the latter days, the last hour, all those phraseologies, but we are not in the day of the Lord. That is yet to come. Okay, the day of the Lord commences when we get out of here. You will not, through the grace of God, go through judgment for your sin. He has relieved you of that. Any questions? Okay. Um, the other assignment I have for you is uh, a fun one. Uh, Granny and I have taken to, uh, the last couple of years, um, when we go to a restaurant, uh, and I always take her to the best places. So Culver's and, you know, places like that. When we see somebody pray, because people pray before they eat, and when we see particularly a, a husband and wife pray, we always go talk to them and to introduce ourselves and and uh, ask them. I, I, the The conversation is immediately focused on the Lord, 
It's, it's been amazing. So if you see somebody pray before they eat in a restaurant, uh, please take the time to just go introduce yourself and let, tell them you're a Christian, you're a believer, and, uh, and you'll have some amazing conversations. We have found that some of the most fun we've had at restaurants is talking to those folks. Okay? Any closing thoughts then? All right. We'll just go in the circle. We'll go in the circle of life. All right? And we'll start with uh, Pastor Briggs. Would you start for us? Uh, Herb, would you would you rent the veil and go next? Okay. And then we'll have Lauren, number second Lauren, right? Second Lauren. We had third Lauren, but second Lauren. And then Jose. We're gonna do four guys today. And you're gonna have to speak up so the microphone can hear you. What? Come quickly, Lord. Be with us this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen.